Bun găsit la emisiunea Știință și Cunoaștere. Voi începe mai întâi cu cele mai sincere mulțumiri pentru faptul că, datorită dumneavoastră, anul acesta, 2017, începând cu data de 21 aprilie, pagina de Facebook a emisiunii mi-a indicat un salt peste 800% în audiență, iar pagina de YouTube a emisiunii a înregistrat aproape 10 milioane de minute vizionate, din care 1 milion în doar prima parte a anului 2017. De asemenea, rata de înscrieri pe pagina mea de Facebook a crescut de 10 ore, astfel că dacă în ultimii 7 ani aceasta era de 5-6 noi cereri de prietenie pe zi, acum este de 50-60 noi cereri de prietenie pe zi și peste 400 de activități pe zi, adică like-uri, share-uri, mesaje, emoticoane, tag-uri și follow-uri. Voi citi toate mesajele dumneavoastră, dar vă rog să aveți răbdarea necesară. Le parcurg pe fiecare, dar uneori ele necesită răspunsuri elaborate. Probabil creșterea audienței peste un anumit prag, corelată cu interesul Facebook de a câștiga publicitate, ne-au favorizat în așa fel încât beneficiile să fie echitabile pentru toți. Emisiunea, dumneavoastră și managementul Facebook, care încă ne oferă posibilitatea interacțiunii gratuite pe acest site. Așa că revin cu cele mai călduroase mulțumiri pentru faptul că apreciați emisiunea Știință și Cunoaștere. Am postat liste întregi cu linkurile arhivei Știință și Cunoaștere, atât pe episoade individuale, cât și playlisturi de grupuri de episoade asociate unei anumite tematici. Pentru a găsi mai ușor informația de care aveți nevoie, alegeți mai întâi un playlist definit prin tematică, după care căutați pe baza descrierilor care emisiune din acel grup ar putea conține informația de care aveți nevoie. În ultima perioadă am remarcat o creștere excepțională a audienței emisiunilor care tratează subiectul psihologiei relațiilor intime, observând astfel că cel puțin una din întâlnirile cu profesorul Daniel David și o alta cu profesorul american Bruce Lipton au ajuns pe locurile 7, respectiv 8, cea cu profesorul Daniel David, depășind 11.000 de vizualizări, după cum se poate observa pe această pagină de afișare generată de YouTube. Toate acestea sunt corelate unui număr de peste 400 de mesaje primite de la dumneavoastră în ultimii 5 ani, din care 100 menționează interesul crescut pentru emisiuni despre psihologia relațiilor intime. Acest fapt m-a determinat să planific o nouă serie dedicată psihologiei cu profesorul Daniel David, dar, ocazional, o să prezint și materiale produse de Bruce Lipton, pe care domnia sa mi le oferă gratuit, pe termen nelimitat, ori de câte ori va posta noutăți pe pagina sa de YouTube. Cele mai noi care au apărut lunile trecute tratează tocmai acest subiect al relațiilor intime, respectiv al relațiilor umane de cooperare. Ele vor face obiectul emisiunii de azi și sunt convins că așteptați cu nerăbdare să-l revedeți pe Bruce Lipton, comentând câteva idei născute din propria sa experiență de viață. Fiecare material este împărțit pe subcapitole pe care le voi comenta pe parcurs. În continuare, Bruce Lipton vă prezintă un rezumat al experienței legate de propria sa căsnicie și motivele care l-au determinat să facă o schimbare, toate acestea fiind consemnate în cartea sa numită Efectul lunii de miere, care între timp a apărut și în traducere în limba română. Aveți posibilitatea să aflați mai multe detalii cu ajutorul adreselor de internet afișate pe ecran. Hi, dear friends and cultural creatives, Bruce here, and I have a wonderful presentation to offer you today. And this is a presentation on the new book called The Honeymoon Effect, The Science of Creating Heaven on Earth. For me, totally exciting topic to talk about, especially because I am the last guy that you would ever imagine to have written a book about relationships. Uh, I got married very, very young in my uh, 21st year. Uh, and after 10 years of marriage uh, and my immaturity and understanding the nature of relationships, uh, I ended up uh, getting divorced. I actually made a commitment to myself. I said, thank you, universe, for letting me out of that relationship, and I promise I will never do that again. And so for every day, for 17 years, when I would shave every morning, I had my own little mantra. It would go something like this. I'll never get married again. I'll never get married again. So for 17 years, I was clearly not marriageable material or even interested in the concept. And yet, through the understanding offered by the biology, the lessons I learned from the cells, the information from the biology of belief, and the understanding from spontaneous evolution, all the work derived from this cellular research, I learned a new understanding about life. One so profound that it led me into a relationship and my experience of feeling and living heaven on earth. And I understand now the process 
for how we create these loving relationships and also the problems that inevitably cause these relationships to fall apart. So basically, the honeymoon effect is a story about the biology and the psychology of creating relationships. And what I would like you to do just to start off this program is to go back to a time in your life where you fell head over heels in love with somebody and get yourself back into that state. And if you can get there, let me ask you three questions about that time period. Number one, when you were fully in love like that, were you healthy? Well, it turns out almost everyone says they were exuberantly healthy in that time when they fell in love. I then offer the next question by asking, hey, did you have a lot of energy when you fell in love? And everyone laughs because they know for sure that they made love for days without stopping for food or for sleep. And more importantly, the third question I ask of people in love is this, when you're in love like that, is life so beautiful you can't wait for the next day to have more? And almost everybody says, absolutely, absolutely, that was so wonderful. And then I say, well, look, put all those things together. Being in love like that was tantamount to experiencing heaven on earth. And everyone says, yeah, it, it was so beautiful. It was the best part of life. Well, let me tell you this right from the get-go. This was not an accident. It wasn't a coincidence. It wasn't a fluke of nature. It was actually something you created. You created the honeymoon. You lived that honeymoon. And for almost all of us, we lose that honeymoon experience and that great loving relationship either turns into regular life and very frequently those relationships end with great questions. How could this thing that started so beautifully end so badly? So to go back to all this, let's just recognize this. Before you met that person in your life that really just knocked you for a loop, life was just everyday stuff. It may not have been that great. Matter of fact, it, it may have been just a pain for you. Just life was, ah. But when you met this person, all of a sudden, your whole life changed. You lit up. You were physiologically and psychologically running at more peak performance than ever before. This is the beginning of the honeymoon. This is that honeymoon expression where uh, it's like living in a thatched hut in the Caribbean and all your cares and woes are gone. And this is how the relationships start. But unfortunately, most honeymoons end in this fashion. So the question is, how did we create that honeymoon? And why did we lose that honeymoon? And if we can provide answers to those questions, then we're left with a wonderful understanding and a conclusion that is just mind blowing. And that is this, if you understand how you created it and you understand the reasons why you lost it, then you have an understanding to recreate the honeymoon experience and make it an everyday experience for you while you're alive on this planet. În continuare, Bruce Lipton dorește să facă o comparație metaforică pur ilustrativă și pe care vă rog să o preluați ca atare între fizica undelor și emoțiile noastre. Metaforele ne ajută să înțelegem clar, simplu și repede anumite chestiuni care sunt studiate la nivel academic și prin urmare se adresează experților. Emisiunea Știință și Cunoaștere nu se adresează experților și nu intenționează să concureze cu universitățile. La știință și cunoaștere învățați despre ceea ce ar fi util și de maximă urgență, inclusiv faptul de a vă adresa specialiștilor atunci când ați observat că există o problemă. Știință și cunoaștere vă ajută cum să descoperiți problema atunci când aceasta este greu de observat, iar Bruce Lipton are darul de a ne transmite această înțelegere. We're familiar with a picture of an atom as a particle, but that's a Newtonian perspective. The new physics, called quantum physics, actually looks at the energy. So rather than a particle, an atom looks like this. It's got waves of energy. And in fact, the, the atom itself in the center of all those waves doesn't even physically exist, so let's remove that. What does an atom look like? Ripples in a pond. Now, the question is, what happens if the energy from one atom interacts with the energy from another atom? Do they just pass through each other independently? And the answer is absolutely not. When ripples engage with each other, they entangle and they create what is called an interference pattern where one set of ripples alters the ripples from the other energy source. To give a model of that, let's take a simple experiment. I take two rocks, equal size, equal mass, and hold them exactly the same height above the water and then drop them at exactly the same time into the water. 
The ripples from one rock are moving this way. The ripples from the other rock are moving this way. And the question is, what happens when the ripples get together and they meet each other? That's a point of entanglement. Well, to illustrate it, just uh, let's look at our picture. Here you see the ripples coming from the left and the right, uh, and they converge toward the center. And the question is, what happens in that center? In the first image, let me just show you, it's a, just a simple model. I'll overlap the waves because I want to demonstrate something, and that is this. At the interface where two sets of ripples meet, you add up the values of the ripples uh, uh, over each other. So in our first example, you have one ripple at plus one height and the bottom ripple at plus one height. And I say, well, what is the result of that? I say, add them together. So when those two ripples come together, the height of the wave is plus two. And I say over here, the valley of the ripple is minus one, and beneath it, the valley of the other ripple is minus one. And I say, put those together, and it's minus two. Now, when you look at what is the net result, watch the two ripples coming together in harmony. They're both going up, they're both going down, and they come together, and lo and behold, where they entangle, the energy of each set of atoms converges, and they couple with each other, they entangle with each other, they interfere with each other, causing the waves to be much higher. So two energies come together and create greater energy. That's interference, but it's called constructive interference. So it just says two energies can come together and amplify each other. I'm going to show you this picture. It looks almost exactly the same as before. Two rocks above the water, and I'm dropping them, but here's what the difference is. I drop one rock before I drop the other rock. What's the net result? As one ripple is going up, the other ripple coming toward it is going down. As that one's going up, the other one's going down. So they're out of phase. So I say, well, what happens if two sets of ripples out of phase come together? Well, they interfere as well, but look as you see, let's do the same thing. We'll bring them together, overlap them, and then add up the numbers and then determine the value of the waves. And as we can see, one wave is plus one, and below it, the other wave is minus one. Add that together, zero. This wave is minus one, the other wave is plus one. Add them together, zero. Now look at the third image as the two waves out of phase come toward each other. When they interfere with each other, they cancel each other out. And this is interference, but it's not constructive, it's destructive interference. You say, oh great, Bruce, all this physics stuff this is really neat, but what does this have to do with relationships? The answer is this. We're made out of atoms and molecules. We vibrate energy. Everything vibrates energy. And everything we interact with, its energy interacts with us. Some things we interact with, and it enhances our energy because we have more energy. That is the consequence of constructive interference. But as we know it in our biological world, it's called good vibes. And I say, but what happens if two energies come together and they cancel each other out? And I go, ah, oh, you've experienced that in your world too. It's destructive interference, but you know it as Bad vibes. În continuare, Bruce Lipton va prezenta o altă metaforă, pornind de la faptul că peste tot în lumea microscopică a atomilor și moleculelor există un echilibru și legături denumite metaforic dependențe, necesare menținerii acestui echilibru. Dacă nu ar exista acest echilibru și legăturile chimice, atunci nu ar putea exista substanțe chimice. Bruce Lipton vrea să ne arate metaforic faptul că, în contextul relațiilor intime, legăturile trebuie să conducă spre echilibre armonioase și nu spre dependențe dezastroase. Din acest motiv, vă rog din nou să priviți expunerea sa ca pe o metaforă cu rol educativ, pur didactic, pentru înțelegerea legăturilor unei relații intime. E doar un alt mod de a explica lucrurile folosind metafore și comparații. Potassium has an extra electron, chlorine is missing an electron, the two come together, and then look, they spin in perfect balance. Well, this is interesting because you would say, oh yes, consider the atoms as people, and you say, oh, chlorine and potassium come together and they create such a wonderful, loving couple. But I say, well, there's a problem with that, and that is the potassium and chlorine, yes, they spin in balance, but they represent a codependent relationship which is different than the noble gas. The noble gas is spinning in perfect balance and doesn't make any relationships at all. It's already in perfect balance. So that's why the noble gases don't make chemistry. They don't need another element to bring them balance because noble gases by their nature are already in balance. 
It's the other 112 elements that are out of balance that seek chemical coupling to create that balance. The problem, as I mentioned, though, is chemical coupling means codependency. The potassium will do okay as long as the chlorine is there. But if the chlorine's not there, then the potassium begins to wobble. So there's a tendency to bring the two together that one says, I need you, you need me. Well, codependency. And the significance about that is then I could be a bad potassium and you could be a wonderful chlorine. And yet I push on you by saying, well, I'm going to do all these things. And you're saying, don't do that. And I say, yeah, what are you going to do about it? If I leave, you're out of balance. And all of a sudden you realize, what does codependent relationship mean? It means that I must be with you because together we create that balance. And therefore, there's a tendency for codependent relationships to become troublesome. Because if one starts to not participate very well, the other one still has to accept them because it's what created that balance. În continuare, Bruce Lipton ne explică legătura dintre emoțiile noastre și chimia creierului. Aceasta nu mai e o metaforă, ci o realitate științifică cunoscută de foarte multă vreme. in response to the stimuli in the world around you, your brain can release different kinds of things, such as oxytocin, dopamine, vasopressin, serotonin. Uh, all these different factors are released by the brain. The brain is the equivalent of a paint mixer. It interprets the stimuli in the world and then releases different concentrations of neuropeptides, neurohormones, that when put in the blood are the equivalent of tinting the blood a different color based on the collective nature of the stimuli. So all of a sudden it says this, when you look at the world and you interpret what's going on, your brain takes that interpretation and translates it into a chemical that is released into the blood. The chemistry of the blood then goes to the cells and controls the movement and behavior of the cells. So it really becomes important to understand this, is that your emotions, which cause you to move in the world, are driven by the stimuli and your interpretation of the stimuli which are translated into neurosecretions. Ajungem acum la psihologia relațiilor intime, cea care ne interesează în mod deosebit. Iar Bruce Lipton ne va explica diferențele dintre conștient și subconștient sau inconștient, dacă vrem să fim în consonanță cu abordarea curentă din cărțile de specialitate. Americanii folosesc terminologia de conștient și subconștient dar în zona noastră se folosește terminologia de conștient și inconștient, iar inconștientul poate avea mai multe nuanțe. We have a mind that interfaces between the environment and our biology. The mind's job is to read the information in the environment, assess what's going on, and then create behaviors that will allow us to sustain ourselves and continue to thrive in an ever-changing environment. So when we talk about the mind, we say, oh, the mind, but actually the mind is comprised of two interdependent elements called the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. They're both part of the brain, but they have different functions and activities, uh, even though they're interdependent and related to each other, they learn in different ways and respond in different ways. And this is very critical for us to understand the nature of how the conscious mind and the subconscious mind work, because it's the conscious mind that brings us into the honeymoon experience. And as I'll talk about, it's the subconscious conscious mind that essentially ends that honeymoon experience for us. If we understand the nature of how these two minds interact, then guess what? Not only are we free to create the honeymoon experience, but we'll be able to learn how to adjust our biology and our psychology to maintain a honeymoon experience for your entire life. În continuare, Bruce Lipton ne prezintă o serie de învățături care să ne ajute în menținerea acelei stări emoționale sau o experiență intimă cunoscută sub denumirea foarte apreciată de, în ghilimele, luna de miere. Bruce Lipton dorește să ne arate că luna de miere poate să dureze mai mult de o lună. Așadar, efectul ei, cum precizează și titlul cărții, efectul lunii de miere, ar putea să se mențină o viață întreagă. Revin asupra faptului că expresia luna de miere este o metaforă cunoscută și înțeleasă de mult timp, având conotații inspirate din realitatea cotidiană. If you want to sustain a honeymoon experience which you create from your conscious mind and its activity, there are two ways to do that. 
One is just continuously operate from the conscious mind because that's the mind that created the honeymoon. It's a process called mindfulness, but it's a very difficult process because in the world in which we live, we're so bombarded with ideas and thoughts and requirements that our conscious mind is completely engaged with thinking. The moment the conscious mind is engaged with thinking, that's when we default to the subconscious. So if you can stay in the conscious mind, you can stay in the honeymoon experience. But if we then default to the subconscious, that's when we introduce behavior that sabotages the honeymoon. So what can we do about that? And the answer is, thank God, we can reprogram the subconscious mind. You can eliminate the programs that are detrimental or sabotaging you or taking you away from your goals and aspirations and replace them with programs that will encourage everything you want in life. But to understand this, we have to understand that the conscious and the subconscious mind learn in totally two different ways. The conscious mind is the creative mind. The conscious mind, of course, is the one connected to your personal identity, your spirit, your source, whatever way you want to describe that. And I say it's a creative mind, meaning this, how can the conscious mind learn? I go, well, it could read a self-help book. And just from reading the book, the conscious mind could say, ah, oh, yes, I sh I, this is what I should know. This is how I should do things. And so, so many people read self-help books. And then I say at the end, has your life changed? And most people say, well, no, not really at all. And I say, well, is it because you don't know the information? And I go, I ask you questions and your conscious mind can repeat back everything in the book. So I say, oh, well, you got all this information in your conscious mind. So why isn't your life changing? And the answer is, because we only use that conscious mind about 5% of the time. And just because the conscious mind learned from reading the book, it didn't mean the subconscious mind learned. So the subconscious mind still has the original programs in it, so you're still in the same place. So here's the point. The conscious mind being creative can learn from reading a self-help book, going to a lecture, watching a movie. The conscious mind can learn from something as simple as, aha, I just figured it out. So the conscious creative mind has many different ways of downloading information. But the two minds are not connected in the sense that if the conscious mind learns something, does it mean that the subconscious mind has learned this as well? And the answer is absolutely not. The conscious mind learns through its creative processes, but the subconscious mind learns primarily in two ways. And now there's a third way that we can talk about. And I say, so what's different? I say, conscious mind, read a book, watch a movie, hear a lecture. It's downloaded. It already knows. Subconscious mind doesn't learn that way. The subconscious mind is a habit mind. Well, there's two ways to get programs into that subconscious mind. Number one was the way we downloaded information into the subconscious mind in the first six or seven years of life, and that is this. The subconscious mind is operating at a vibrational frequency of theta, which is hypnosis. So it says, oh, yes, you can download information straight into the subconscious if your mind is in a state of hypnosis. So that's one way of acquiring a program. I said, well, the first six or seven years, that brain of a child is predominantly operating in theta hypnosis. But now you're older. Now what do you do? I go, well, here's an interesting fact. Twice a day your brain goes through a period of theta vibrational activity. Twice a day, your brain is prepared to download information through hypnosis. I say, well, when does that occur? Well, remember, there are vibrational frequencies that ramp up. When you're sleeping, you're at the lowest vibrational frequency called delta. As you start to wake up, but you're not fully awake, that's twilight reverie. That's where you're just waking up and everything. You're still in a dream world. You're in the real world. You're mixing the two. That's a period called theta. So you go from dead sleep delta. As you begin to wake, the vibrations start to go up and you're in theta. So there's a period of theta where hypnosis is, can occur. But as you get more awake, theta gets to a higher vibration alpha. That's calm consciousness. You're just waking up. You're doing your routine chores of getting ready to leave the house. And by the time you're getting ready to go to work or at work, your brain ramps from alpha calm conscious to beta, which is the active consciousness that we usually engage in the busy world in which we live. Well, then you come back home. Well, you've been operating in beta at work, and guess what? You come home, you start to calm down, your brain slips into the lower vibrational frequency, alpha calm consciousness, and as you start to get ready to go to bed, guess what? From alpha, it drops down to theta as you start to fall off to go to sleep. And when you finally are in sleep, you go from theta to delta. So that means 
as you're going to sleep, as you're going from the alert state to the sleep state, you also pass through theta. So twice a day, your brain is engaged in theta. On the way in waking up, going from delta to higher vibrations, you pass through theta. On the way of going to sleep, you go from higher vibrations to delta, and again, pass through theta. So twice a day, your brain is in a state where it is in a state of hypnosis theta. And this is where you can use subliminal tapes to reprogram your subconscious mind. As you go to bed, if you put earphones on with uh, subconscious programming to change whatever behaviors you want to change, as you're going to bed, those earphones on your head, as you go into theta, your alpha consciousness is now disappearing. You're in theta, and in that period of theta, which is twilight reverie, the recording of the tape is being downloaded straight into the subconscious. And that's how subliminal tapes work. So if you want to change a program, you can select a tape that will have the program that you desire to put into your mind. And every night as you go to bed, just put the earphones on and you will be in a process of self-hypnosis. Well, hypnosis is indeed the first way the subconscious mind learns. But after you pass six or seven years of age, the subconscious mind learns in a different way, and that is called habituation. Meaning, if you repeat something and repeat it and repeat it, the subconscious mind will download it and make it a habit. So for example, you wanted to uh, learn the ABCs. How did you learn the ABCs? You started A, B, C, D, E, and then you couldn't remember, and then you start A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and you repeat it, and you repeat it, and finally you get the Z. And guess what? After repeating the alphabet hundreds of times, there's a point where now it's part of the subconscious. So guess what? It's now downloaded in your mind. If I ask you to give me the sequence of the alphabet, you can simply rattle off unconsciously A through Z without even thinking about it. Why? You created a habit that downloaded the alphabet. So, after you're six or seven, and you want to change programming your life, a way of doing it is the conventional way, is creating a habit, repeating something on almost a religious level. Let me just make it clear. A sticky note on the refrigerator is not a habit. A sticky note on the refrigerator is more or less a wish. Every time you look at it, oh, I wish that would be true, but that's not a habit. A habit means you have to do something and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. That's the way you learn uh, everything after you're seven, and that's how you learn how to drive a car, uh, for example, or the work that you do or whatever activities you get involved with when you repeat them, they become habits in the subconscious mind. A third way, which is a more recent understanding and a more effective way of changing uh, subconscious programming is through belief change modalities or energy psychology. Uh, these are collectively uh, processes by which you open up the mind into a state of super learning where you can download information virtually instantaneously and rewrite programs in a matter of 10 minutes even. A program that's been affecting your whole life, you can rewrite that uh, using these new belief change modalities and, and creating downloads of new behaviors in matters of minutes. Again, it's tantamount to super learning. You say, what's super learning? I say, well, maybe you've seen a demonstration where a person can open up a book and they read the book. As fast as they move their finger down the page, they read the page. And so they're flipping through the pages. Guess what? Super learning. Well, if you employ that process, you can encourage the download of new behaviors into the subconscious mind. But now comes a very important issue. What are the programs you have to change in your subconscious mind? Especially important is the fact that most of these programs were introduced into you even during the last stage of uh, pregnancy, the last trimester, in the first six or seven years of your life. So I say to you, well, tell me about the programs that you learned when you were one year old. Tell me about the programs you learned when you were two years old. And you go, ah, I don't know. I wasn't consciously aware of those things. I go, yeah, because consciousness started more around six or so. So I say, well, how do you know then the programs that you have? Here's the fun part of the whole thing. Science has revealed that we operate our lives 5% of the time from the conscious mind and 95% of the time our behaviors are controlled by the programs in the subconscious mind. What does it mean? It's simple. 
Your life is essentially a printout of your subconscious programs. That's what you're operating 95% of the time. So you want to know what the programs are? It's very simple. Look at your life. The things that work for you and that come to you and the things that you want come to you because you have programs in the subconscious that encourage their being there. But anything you struggle with, anything you have to work hard at, anything you put an effort into, you're doing that because you're trying to overcome a program of limitation that is preventing you from going there. So all you have to do is look at your life and say, hey, what works for me works because I already have programs to support that. What I'm struggling with in life, I'm having a problem with because I have subconscious programs that do not encourage that behavior. So right away, you automatically know what behaviors do you want to change? They're the ones that you have difficulty with. Okay, how do you change them? Well, you can use self-hypnosis, the subliminal tapes. You could change them by creating new behavioral habits that you repeat every day religiously, changing the old behavior and rewriting it live every time, saying, no, don't do it that way. No, don't do it that way. Talking to yourself and saying, that's not what I want. This is what I want. And you constantly repeat this to yourself. Guess what? Habit will inevitably change that program and put it into the new program. So now we're down to a very fundamental understanding of life. And that fundamental understanding of life is this. Your life is an expression of your programs because 95% of your life comes from the subconscious. That if you want to change your life, you could do either of two things. Stay in the conscious mind, be mindful, or two, rewrite the programs in your subconscious mind. We already talked about how you rewrite the programs. Uh, and just to emphasize this one more time, think about this. How many of us talk to ourselves and say, oh, come on, Bruce, don't do that. That's such a stupid thing. And I'm talking to myself to try to change a behavior. And it's very frustrating because the more I talk at myself, the less the behavior is changing. And the more I talk, the more angry I get with myself because my, I'm not listening to my own suggestions. And then I ask people to stop for a moment. I say, you're talking to yourself. Who are you talking to? And you say, well, I'm talking to my subconscious mind. I go, well, there's the problem. The subconscious mind is like a tape recorder. There's nobody in there. So all of that effort to try to change the subconscious mind by talking to it is a waste of time for a very simple reason. There's nobody in there to respond to your new wishes and your new desires you actually have to engage hypnosis, habituation, or the super learning techniques to rewrite those subconscious programs. And I say, what is the consequence of rewriting it? And simple answer is this. What would be the consequence if your subconscious programs matched the wishes, desires, and aspirations you hold in your conscious mind? And the answer is this. Well, it was the conscious mind that gave you the honeymoon effect, and it was a subconscious mind that normally takes it away. But if you default into a subconscious mind that has the same wishes and desires as the conscious mind, then what that really means is this, is that you are always operating from your wishes and desires, even if you default into that subconscious programming. The point is critical, and that is, since it's the conscious mind that created the honeymoon effect, Putting the conscious mind programs into the subconscious means you can maintain the honeymoon effect for the rest of your life. So, I have a simple honeymoon checklist to understand what we can do and how we can change our lives to, to make the honeymoon a way of life. Number one is this, do a conscious mind review. Remember, the conscious mind has your wishes, desires, and aspirations. So, Make a list. What is it you want out of life? Write down those things that your conscious mind wishes and desires because now you can see them in front of you and say, yes, this is exactly what I want. There used to be an old phrase, be careful of what you ask for uh, because you're going to end up getting it. Well, uh, Margaret, my partner, said that was a really negative way of saying that. She said, let's write it this way. Be conscious of what you ask for, because as you write this list of your wishes and desires, you will inevitably be setting up situations to experience exactly what you wrote. So now the first step is, what is it you want out of life? Well, wishes and desires, aspirations, conscious mind review. But now number two, you have to understand what your subconscious mind is doing, so you need to review that. And I say, well, how do you review your subconscious mind? And the answer is quite simple. Your subconscious mind is 95% of your life, so you want to know what your subconscious mind programs are? Review your life. And the significance is this. 
If there are things you struggle with that you want, that means you have to rewrite those beliefs in the subconscious mind and put in the more positive thing that you're looking for. You can reprogram the subconscious mind. So anything that you're struggling to acquire and you're not getting there, it's really a reflection that you have programs in the subconscious mind and they're not supporting your conscious mind. So you can reprogram your subconscious mind. How do you reprogram your subconscious mind? Three different ways. Number one, hypnosis, using subliminal tapes, for example, because that is the primary way we learned in the first place. Number two, you can engage in creating new habits. Keep redirecting your activity toward the place you want to go. Make a habit, repeat it. If you're off the track, then just let go and get back on the track. Every time you return back to the track, the subconscious mind is beginning to learn, oh, you want to be on this track, not on this track. By repeating this over and over again, a habit will lead you on a new track. And for me, the most exciting thing is because Civilization is in a very big crisis right now and it's really due to human behavior. We need to change behavior quickly and that's why there's a whole variety of new super learning techniques including belief change modalities. Um, this website, you could look under resources and find 20 or 30 different ways of engaging super learning to rewrite the subconscious mind. Now that you have understood this and you're adjusting your subconscious programming to uh, conform with your wishes and desires, guess what? A relationship means you must be involved with the other person and that means you must have communication with them. So understand this, if you want to work on a honeymoon effect, both people in the relationship have to be aware of the nature of the conscious and subconscious programming because if only one person knows about it and the other person doesn't, there's no communication. When one trying to fix the other and the other is not even aware that they're broken, that, that leads to more breakup of relations than actually fixing relationships. So communication is the first level. Every individual in this relationship must have an awareness of how they're engaged in it and what controls it regarding conscious and subconscious mind. And then recognize this, you're trying to make changes and they don't happen right away. And the significance is what do you need? Patience for a simple reason. You have to have patience in reprogramming because you're dealing with habits that will automatically replay themselves every time. You're trying to rewrite a habit, so you have to create a new habit. It's not gonna happen the first time or the second time. But as you become aware and conscious of it, every time a negative behavior shows up and you are becoming more conscious, you are in the power position of changing that behavior at that moment and then engaging in behaviors that you really want. Therefore, not only does it take patience, but it takes practice. So you and your partner in a relationship have to have the dialogue with each other. When a behavior shows up that one of the individuals is, is creating and unaware of, then the other person must say, look, uh, you perhaps didn't see what you just said or what you just did, uh, automatic subconscious behavior, uh, it wasn't really the best thing. And through a nice dialogue and through practice, what you can end up is again, leading to an opportunity to engage with each other and as a result, create new programming that supports both your wishes and desires and aspirations. And this is the next and last step of putting that honeymoon relationship back together. So in conclusion, what can we say about this whole honeymoon effect is this. Number one, people talk about mind-body interactions and mind controlling life. And well, a lot of people say, my mind wouldn't have created this life. You can go back to a point where you fell in love and recognize a very simple truth. What you created was not an accident. It was an activation of your conscious wishes, desires, and aspirations. You already did create heaven on earth. The issue is what happened to it? And I said, ah, the interference from the subconscious mind. If you understand the programming and how that programming is the default behavior, and you understand how you can rewrite that programming, then you're given an opportunity to eliminate the negative um, programs in your subconscious that have been sabotaging you, and instead replace them with behaviors that correspond with your wishes and desires. And when you do that, the, so that your conscious mind and your subconscious mind have the same program, then guess what? At that moment, whether you're paying attention or whether you're not paying attention, 
you'll be engaged in the honeymoon experience. It never has to go away. The honeymoon is an experience that you could have your whole life. This is why we were here. We were here to create heaven on earth. The one time you did it is when you fell in love. It could have stayed that way if you understood the mechanisms we have described here. But when you do understand the mechanisms, it says you can go back and recreate that and make it a permanent way of life. You were born into heaven. You've experienced it once or more, and you can do it again and again and again, because that's how powerful you are. You are a creator, and you are in heaven. When you use your creation, you will manifest heaven every day in your life and enjoy the beauty of a living experience on this wonderful planet, the honeymoon effect the science of creating heaven on earth. Pentru mai multe informații puteți consulta linkurile afișate pe ecran. Bruce Lipton având multe articole, materiale, desene și explicații utile celor care au nevoie să aprofundeze. Aceasta a fost o prezentare sub forma unui rezumat în imagini și metafore a ceea ce Bruce Lipton a dorit să ne transmită în cartea sa Efectul lunii de miere, iar în continuare vom extinde înțelegerea relațiilor intime la nivelul relațiilor interumane și de ce ar fi important să înțelegem că nu putem schimba lumea dacă nu ne schimbăm pe noi înșine? O spune și Micea Leduit. You want to change the world? Change yourself. And the world will change automatically. Because you will never experience that kind of world again once you have changed. Very simple. But like everything else profound, very difficult. Problema nu e simplă deloc. În minutele următoare, Bruce Lipton prezintă cazul interesant al unui medic de origine germană stabilit în Statele Unite, portretizat cinematografic în filmul Patch Adams și dorește să ne îndrume către faptul că putem acționa simultan în binele nostru, dar și al celorlalți, formând o unitate funcțională a unei comunități care poate să evolueze. Afirmațiile lui Bruce Lipton trebuie înțelese cu o anumită doză de îngăduință, deoarece toate comparațiile pe care le face sunt de ordin metaforic, didactic și nu reprezintă un absolut ad literam. Cei care nu pot avea această atitudine, evident, vor fi predispuși către critici și aprecieri negative. Ca și o curiozitate pe care personal nu o împărtășesc, cu ocazia anunțării pregătirii unui film documentar, renumitul cosmolog și fizician Stephen Hawking atrage atenția asupra faptului că specia umană se află în pericolul unei noi extinsii și promovează această idee încă din anul 2010 sau chiar mai devreme. Cu sau fără amenințarea unei extinții, eu cred că mesajul lui Bruce Lipton de a ne schimba comportamentul, dacă vrem să schimbăm lumea, este logic, rațional și echilibrat. Repet ceea ce vă spune în materialul care urmează, și anume că nu putem schimba lumea dacă nu ne schimbăm pe noi înșine. Hi dear friends and cultural creatives, Bruce here with this month's newsletter. A lot is going on as you know. You can just read the headlines every day and see the world is in a great state of flux. Ah, well, this is totally expected. We've been talking about an evolutionary change that is coming forth, an evolutionary change that is vital and necessary for our survival for a very simple reason. Science has already revealed that we're deep into the sixth mass extinction of life and that this mass extinction event is being precipitated by human behavior. So consequently, it says that to change the path that we're on, to move on to another avenue where we can succeed and thrive into the future, it says we really have to change our behavior. Well, in helping that change along, Margaret and I have been on the road, kind of busy as of late. Uh, we returned from a wonderful trip to Europe, speaking in Salzburg, Austria, Amsterdam, and in Copenhagen, to audiences that were so open and wonderful and loving, and very receptive to the new science that we have to offer. All of these people are beginning to recognize that the evolution in front of us is not a passive event. It's a participatory event. Each one of us must work toward the evolution. It's not an event of evolution where we're going to just sit home in our easy chairs and one day open up the door and say, oh my goodness, the evolution has happened. No, this is an evolution where each of us humans has to engage our behavior in a very positive, supportive, and communal way to create change in the world. Now this does not mean that you have to go out and you single-handedly change the world. That's actually not the way it works. The way to change the world has actually uh, been understood by an old, old hippie phrase, 
the hippie phrase was, before you go out and change the world, take care of your backyard first. And this is really the key. I'm not asking all of us to go out there and to march in the streets and go out there and physically change the world. What we're looking for is to personally change our lives, to start living in harmony with the environment around us, start supporting the nature of a community, build yourself into a supportive web of life. I always love to use the concept of dolphins and community in this regard for a very simple reason. When a dolphin is sick and has to be able to come up and breathe the air but cannot move, the other dolphins in the pod will take turns lifting the sick dolphin up to the surface, allowing it to breathe, and then allowing it to come back down in the water. This is so profoundly important because it represents the nature of individuals coming together to create community not just for their own immediate survival, but for the survival of all those around them. The conclusion of this whole story is very simply this, is that as each of us makes changes in our lives to live in harmony and efficiency with the world around us, then collectively we create the whole change on the planet. So again, I'm not really asking us to go out and every individual make or lead the charge for change. But indeed, there are people who actually do that. One of them is a friend of ours by the name of Patch Adams. I'm sure you probably have heard that name because he's the medical doctor that was featured in the film, Patch Adams. As Margaret likes to refer to Patch Adams, she said, Patch is the Mother Teresa of American medicine. And what she means by that is Patch has totally dedicated his life to bringing health care to people who cannot afford it. In fact, what Patch has done is he's gone to the poorest, most needy part of the United States and built a hospital in West Virginia. His intention on doing this was to create a health care facility that did not tax the people, but allowed them to get health care without the exorbitant cost of conventional medicine. He creates this wonderful hospital where all the doctors work there as part of a community. In fact, in this community, the doctors and the janitors get exactly the same pay. They do this for helping humanity not to make a profit. This wonderful hospital in West Virginia is providing health care for many, many residents in that area in addition to dental care as well. And all of this is from Patch's heart. He donates all of his money and all of his time to supporting healthcare around the world. Not only is Patch working in West Virginia with those that are in need, but Patch and hundreds of volunteers that follow him around the world have gone to many different countries, Haiti recently, South America, Africa, to go to these places to bring volunteers, bring medical supplies, and bring support and help to the people in those communities. And we just love Patch Adams, and I just want to recognize and honor him because, as I said, he's donated his own personal money that he acquired through years of lectures and workshops that he provides. All of his proceeds go in to healthcare. He is indeed a humanitarian of the highest class on this planet. And I am so glad because we have now connected Patch Adams with our dear friends, Bharat Mitra and Bhavani, the owners of Organic India, uh, this company which is changing the social welfare and health of millions of people in India. So uh, meeting up with Patch and supporting his work has been a wonderful insight into the nature of how individuals can actually lead us into this new evolution. Patch's example is an example of cooperativity, cooperating with those around the world, not looking out for the individual number one, but looking out for the nature of the community and the health of the community. The evolution that we're facing, it is necessary for us to change some of the ways we've been living on this planet. And as I talk about in my book, there are what I call the four fundamental myth perceptions of the apocalypse, four fundamental beliefs that as a population we have created a culture uh, and based our behavior on these beliefs. The one that I want to talk about is the belief that evolution is based on competition. This is a Darwinian belief uh, that is introduced by the notion that life is a struggle for survival and survival is based on a competition for fitness. This is a cultural belief that has us looking out for number one and ignoring the other people in the world, saying, well, if they lose, that's their problem. They're losers in the Darwinian evolutionary race. But a new understanding is coming about, one that I have been talking about, as I said, for over 15 years, and that is this. 
Evolution is not predominantly based on competition. Evolution is based on cooperation. And why I bring it up is a very simple point. A garden, such as the Garden of Eden, is not a battleground. A garden, by definition, represents a cooperative interaction of all the animals and plants in the so-called garden. So rather than looking at that garden with Darwinian glasses and perceiving the struggle, the fight, and the violence, we really should look at the garden and recognize that its presence and its activity is really a reflection of a communal cooperativity. Well, as I said, I've been talking about this over all these years, and guess what? It is just this month that I started to see that finally the public is being introduced to the concept that cooperation is a primary drive force in evolution, not competition. And as illustrated on the front cover of this issue of Scientific American, it's cooperativity that is the most important drive to really help us evolve from where we are into a sustainable future. And I am so appreciative of this because after years of telling people and not being supported by the community, science and the media are now trying to change the cultural beliefs of this world by introducing cooperativity as a fundamental drive force of our evolution. I hope that you can understand uh, my joy in saying that, but I hope you can also understand the need why all of us must now really work together, become totally cooperative, because it's the nature of our community that will allow us to go through the crises that we face and come out the other side in a world of beauty, harmony, and love. Thank you for being on this website. I so appreciate your attention. Aveți posibilitatea să aflați mai multe detalii pe adresele de internet afișate pe ecran. Fiți alături de noi data viitoare la o nouă întâlnire cu știință și cunoaștere la TVR Cluj în fiecare sâmbătă și duminică sau online pe internet începând cu ora 18.30.